We were gasping for air, hands entwined, seeking solace in one another's eyes. And when he smiled, I was up somewhere above my body in the clouds. He kissed me again, softer this time, cupping my face, his tongue reeking havoc on my lust-gripped body. I moved into the space between his legs, feeling the length of his body against mine, willing his fingers to venture lower than the small of my back. Then I remembered the library, and my mouth curled up against his. Feel a little better. I smiled, pecking him on the cheek, chastely. I breathed in that woody scent, wishing I could bottle it and take it home with me. I'd quite happily wake up with that scent on my sheets for the rest of my life. He blinked a few times, like he was clearing the haze of our little clinch, lips forming a grin. Thank you. For calming me down. Our lips met again. The pace slowed down, his arms cradling my body, my hands laced around his neck. His fingers were tentative, moving down my arms, and you know that term, like putty in his hands. Well, that was me. In that moment. Melting big time. Whatever is bothering you, I find it helps to channel your inner warrior. I wanted to know more about earlier. Seeing him pacing and looking so troubled, my heart dropped a little. He frowned at me, amusement flickering in those sultry green orbs. I sing the eye of the tiger in my head. When I have to face morons, like those pompous buggers in there. I offered him. He laughed, the sound deep, yet melodic. His lips moved against my hairline. Eye of the tiger. Yeah, I mean don't steal my song. I find 80s rock works the best. Something like Kansas, or Journey. Ah, Charlie Daniels, or Travis Tritt. I wouldn't even know if he made those names up I giggled into his neck. His hands found mine, and I felt like I was sixteen again. Except when I was sixteen I was perennially single, attending an all-girls school, and spending half of my life online, staring at photographs of Leonardo DiCaprio. I also had the world's worst fringe. But I digress. I was giddy, drunk on his, wild west, swagger, sinking in the whirlpool of my desire, for him. This is the first time I've stopped anywhere and met someone as interesting as you. His breath fanned my neck, and I swallowed the impending moan that threatened. Interesting. Pa. I pulled away from his fingertips, smoothing out my kiss-crumpled dress. Why did I hate that word so much? Interesting was such a boring word. What's wrong with interesting? My face must have said it all. He closed the distance, taking my hand again and reeling me in. Flush against his body, I wondered whether anyone had ever had their heart jump out of their mouths whilst in awe of a man. I had images of having to chase it down the garden. And you're beautiful. I don't think I ever blushed as deeply as I did then. Beautiful. Donna was beautiful. Lissa was beautiful. I was one degree above mundane normal, average, and then he tickled me, under the arms, breaking into my moment of embarrassment, and as I thrashed, laughing harder than I had in years, he caught me in his arms, peppering my jawline with kisses. I fought back, tickling him back, and escaped from his arms, dashing up the stone steps towards the Chinese garden. But he was quick, appearing in front of me, as I crossed the bamboo bridge, slick with rainwater. You know how you feel when you're a child. You're playing hide-and-seek and there's this squeal building in your lungs as you anticipate being found. That sheer joy you get, like a mixture of adrenaline and fear and excitement. I felt all those things as he pulled me into his strong arms, guns displayed through his almost see-through shirt, thanks to the downpour. Thank you, downpour. It was one of those moments where laughter seemed so much louder than the rumbling clouds above us, and I realized Donna's suspicions may not be that far off the mark. In fact, she was probably on point. I should get back inside I whispered into his lips as his face hovered millimeters from mine. 
I didn't sound very firm, but I knew that wedding planner with a stick up her arse would be on my tail, and I knew that the longer I stayed here with him, the more perilous my footing was. Falling in love with a man like him was imminent, a pressing warmth that rifled through me like a hurricane. Letting go of his hand was harder than I imagined it would be, because it felt like if I let go, all of this would just be a figment of my imagination. Let's face it, I wanted to hang into him forever, like a child possessive, clutching a favorite toy and refusing for anyone else to touch it. We rejoined the party, and as soon as I entered, Tarquin accosted me, his face gleeful, a dark liquor in a crystal glass, hanging from his hand, like he was Dean Martin on stage. Ha hello, Shexy, he slurred, winking, and feeling for a solid object to hold into so he didn't career straight into the floor. Well, where did you get to, you naughty girl? Bog off, Tark. I saw you chatting to Dad. Looks like you got what you wanted. I've got work to do. If you don't mind, we should discuss our impending nuptials and con consummating our relation, our engagement. Uh. I left him stuttering and wobbling about, sinking past my dad, who bantered raucously with some stuffy, boring-looking blokes, who nodded at him like those plastic dogs people have in the back of their cars, and didn't even notice me, despite me brushing into his arm to avoid. Scott. There were at least two hundred wedding guests, all of which stayed overnight at the manor, and I had to run into him, repeatedly. What were the odds? And yet I never won anything ever. Sam, I have to speak to you? I feel like I can't leave without. At that moment I looked over a sea of heads, unfamiliar faces, some distant relatives, and there was Rat. He was watching, chin raised defiantly, as if sending me a message. Stay strong. Don't let him get to you. Stay strong, Samantha. I'm busy my voice was disinterested and aloof. I snapped photos of the crowd, holding the camera above my head, and then circled the room, collecting as many different angles as I could. Scott tailed me, and I wondered where Miranda was in all of this. I could see Donna now, taking photos of the seven-tier wedding cake. I focused on her. It's about your dad, Sam. Come on. You owe me this? I owe you nothing I snapped just as we reached where Rhett had been standing. An arm brushed mine, and I felt the warmth of Rhett's fingertips as he gently knotted his digits with mine. I looked into serene pools of earthy green, and he squeezed my fingers gently. Well talk. Hissed Scott. He'll catch you later, he mumbled, under his breath. Boy's dumber than a box of rocks. Rhett lent in, his breath tickling my ear. You all right, darlin, or you need me to teach that ass a little respect. I shivered at the change in the depth of his voice, the bass traveling down my spine. I'm a big girl, I winked. How about you fetch me that hot chocolate? There were rousing speeches that had everyone standing, people bowing at the feet of my father, as per usual, while he passed me withering looks. For all intents and purposes I was Cinderella, the dowdy servant at this wedding. But today, my dad could glare at me, and Mum could roll her eyes, and Lissa could pass critical judgment about my photography. But I had a prince. Rhett brought me drinks, refilling my glasses, and delivered me a plate of food before the good stuff went from the buffet and I was left with cold meat and stale bread. His presence washed away everybody else, and as I moved onto my digital camera, I felt fingertips prodding my back. So did you bone him? Thank God Rhett had headed back to the buffet line. I spun around to see Donna, wearing a fitted purple silk gown, her hair in tumbling waves. No, I did not. And Donna, you look amazing. She gave the obligatory spin. She was a faster change artist that Britney Spears on stage. I had a feeling she was trying to bag her own wedding fling. I've been working my arse off so you could cop off with the American. She placed on hand on her hip. So tell me you sealed the deal. 
We kissed again. That's it. That wasn't it at all. Donna's eyes lit up and she jumped on the spot. I was lucky everyone was so involved in their own conversations. They didn't hear Donna's high-pitched squeals. You did something? I can see it. It was hot dawn. Literally, better than sex. I sighed, but it sounded more like a purr, and the cow elbowed me in the ribs. Holy hell, I want a kiss like that. She fanned herself with a napkin shaped like a duck. Tonight, you bugger off with him and it'll carry on working till the happy couple hit the hay. No ifs, aw ah, buts, madam. Donna, I can't have you working while I know. It's just wrong. My sister would go mental. Or, you stepped in when I had a hangover at least half a dozen times in the last year and worked my early bird shifts at the cafe. And remember that time I was dying of a cold, and you came by with five huge dairy milk chocolate bars, a dozen chick flicks, and a vat of chicken soup. Who cares what Lissa thinks? Let's face it. She only wants pictures of herself, so everything beyond the ceremony ain't making the wedding album anyway. But, told you. No buts. I just expect the play-by-play -play tomorrow. Fine. If it happens, it will happen. You have the craziest imagination. We're just friends, but I didn't believe that. Not anymore. Uh. Stop lying to yourself, Sammers. Now, get your arse up to your room with this. She passed me a yellow plastic bag and folded my arms around it. That's sure fire shag in there. I blinked at her, shaking my head in amusement. Donna, what are you doing? Being the best friend anyone has ever had. Ever. Ever. Go on. I wasn't sure about the sweetheart neckline. I liked straps. I couldn't afford another nip slip at a family gathering. Been there? Done that. Nor was I sure about the way it hugged me, like it was a second skin. The dress had been wrapped in my little pony paper with a tag reading, You shall go to the ball. How could I not smile at that? I curled my hair, trying to emulate Donna's, do. But my hair never seemed as shiny, and I wound up looking as if I'd been dragged through a hedge backwards. With a slick of red gloss, I exhaled and inspected my reflection. Wow! I was shocked. I didn't feel like me. I looked. Presentable. More than presentable. Granted my hair wasn't exactly red carpet ready. And my nude sling backs weren't the perfect accompaniment. But I felt like a million dollars, as the saying goes. I slammed the door to my room shut and came face to face with Scott. Heaven help me. He threw his hand down on the wall beside me, trapping me with his icy cold eyes. Seven years, Samantha. Oh, for God's sake, Scott. It's over. It's finished. There's nothing you can say that. Your dad paid me, Sam. Move out of my way, Scott. Seriously. And then I heard his words again. They rolled around my head as I made my way down the corridor towards the staircase. Whipping my head around, I saw him standing there, eyes narrowed in my direction. My dad did what? Paid me. Twenty-five thousand pounds. To stop seeing you. I don't, I don't understand. Your mom and dad, you know what they're like. They don't accept you for who you are and they wanted you to rejoin their life. They wanted you to marry some lord and stop embarrassing them. They couldn't do that with me in the picture. They paid you. It was a hard decision. Sam. But your dad knew someone in the book industry. He got me the job I have now. So he gave you a bribe. And you're only telling me this now? I was more than shaken up. I knew how meddling mom and dad could be. I knew what they were like. How dad had shagged his way through countless secretaries and socialites, and the press had never got wind of it. He was clever. He had friends in high places. Some of his business ventures, I'm sure, weren't above board, 
but he was powerful, and when he wanted something, nothing got in his way. I'd forgotten how backhanded and malicious he could be. Thank God I got away. I couldn't look at Scott. I didn't want anyone right now, other than my bed, at home, and a lifetime supply of jelly sweets. Storming down the stairs, I heard him behind me, Scott calling out for me to stop, telling me that we could talk, that he'd make everything better. But how? I didn't see Rhett standing at the foot of the stairs, or Donna beside him. I just needed to get away. There could have been an elephant wearing a tuxedo in the hallway, and I'd not have noticed. Bloody hell, Scott, what did you say? Donna was climbing the stairs behind me. Her voice was one of fury and loathing. What the effing hell did you say to her, you miserable little scrot? My feet pounded the hallway till I made my way through to the library. I don't know why I chose to end up there, but I flung open the doors and threw myself down on the chaise long. He hadn't loved me. Ever. A man worth his salt would have thrown that money back in Dad's face and told him where to go. He'd have been mortified, disgusted at the thought, and he'd reassure me nothing could ever break us. Instead, he carved out a whole new life for himself. A life that didn't involve me. So I was that easy to forget about. His feelings were that easy to buy. Hey! It was Rhett's voice. He sounded a little strangled and distant. I lifted my head to see him standing by the windows, his expression pained. It'll go, if you want me to. I was gonna help Donna out, but it seems like she's fine on her own, he chuckled, before wiping his mouth and a somber expression replacing the smile. It'll go. I just want you to know that I'm here. If you wanna talk. I nodded, swallowing the angsty, ugly tears. I was ready to cry over my pathetic family, who conspired to take my happiness away from me. Why was I surprised? Is, is my mascara running down my face? Rhett crossed the room and crouched down beside me, checking my eye makeup. His eyes cradled mine, and he pushed a curl off my forehead. You look perfect, he whispered. Is that code for you have mascara everywhere? No, he picked up my hand and kissed the back below the knuckles. Donna said she had something to show me, and then there you were on that staircase, looking like heaven's little devil. Oh, Donna, I groaned, face against the cushions. I'm sorry. I'm not, he stroked my back tenderly. I brought us this, he lifted a bottle of whiskey from the floor. It might not be your favorite drink, but tonight I don't want to drink alone, and you look like you need a friend. Tell me about earlier, I had to ask. A problem shared was a problem halved, and I didn't fancy going over my woes. He was forthcoming, speaking freely, almost like a dam had burst and he needed to talk. I had a call from my mom. Haven't seen her in six months, because of work. I haven't been in home. For fourteen months, he swallowed a long glug of whiskey, wiping his mouth with his sleeve. Whoa! I rolled onto my back, looking up at the ceiling. What's that like? He passed me the bottle, and I felt the heat as the liquid slid down my throat. His fingers drew patterns on my palm, lazy movements that brought home the intimacy of this moment. Working away from home. Hell, it's hard. I bet what made you want to travel so much? I needed more alcohol. Tonight I was getting well and truly slaughtered. That is a good question. When I was a kid, I watched my dad working the farm, and that was all I wanted to do. I wanted to be him, raising a family and doing good, honest work. The kind of work that makes your back ache, but you get to watch the fields fill up with sunshine in the mornings and watch the moon over the crops as night falls. And then one day my dad lost his farm. He didn't want to sell. He stood his ground. But the other guy, he was a developer, and he made it impossible for us to stay. Sully Dad's reputation had the mayor on his payroll. Even then, I knew we were just money, a place the guy would never venture out to. 
He didn't care what happened to us he held on to the bottle, closing his eyes as he sought comfort at the bottom of the bottle. I'm so sorry I sat up, Rhett still on the floor beside me, and I stroked his cheek, his eyes fixed on the Persian carpet beneath him. I'm so sorry, Rhett. That sounds awful. Did your dad find another job? Did you find somewhere else to live? I took the whiskey from him, pressing the cool glass against my lips. Yeah, we found a little house in Kent. It needed a lot of work, but me and my brothers, we helped our mom. Dad got sick that winter, and every day he just seemed weaker. He died the day after Christmas. Heart attack? I moved down onto the floor and clasped his hand in mine. Oh, God, that's awful, Rhett. I rested my forehead against his arm, and he filtered his fingers through my curls. That's why I travel, I guess. I wanted to find a job, whereby I could pay Mom's bills, but I find it damned hard being there sometimes, going back home. Because you miss your dad. I miss a lot of things. Staying away makes it easier, you know. I know, I murmured, thinking of how much more in control. I felt away from my family. It was a different situation, but I'd probably do the same if I'd walked in his shoes. It didn't bear thinking about. Nothing I'd been through could rival the pain his family must have been dragged through, all so someone could make apartment blocks on their land. I took another slug from the bottle, wincing at the burn. The booze was taking effect now, and I wanted to hold him more than I wanted him to hold me. Bugger being nervous naked. With every tuff his hands on my skin, I fell a little harder for him. And it felt like now, or never, come back to my room with me. I uttered, locking my eyes with his. Please. He kissed my palm, his cheeks reddened from the alcohol. Or maybe the lust that I felt too, pooling between my thighs with heady urgency. Let's go, he drawled, setting every inch of me ablaze. We were gasping for air, hands entwined, seeking solace in one another's eyes. And when he smiled I was up somewhere above my body in the clouds. He kissed me again, softer this time, cupping my face, his tongue reeking havoc on my lust-gripped body. I moved into the space between his legs, feeling the length of his body against mine, willing his fingers to venture lower than the small of my back. Then I remembered the library, and my mouth curled up against his. Feel a little better. I smiled, pecking him on the cheek, chastely. I breathed in that woody scent, wishing I could bottle it and take it home with me. I'd quite happily wake up with that scent on my sheets for the rest of my life. He blinked a few times, like he was clearing the haze of our little clinch, lips forming a grin. Thank you. For calming me down. Our lips met again. The pace slowed down, his arms cradling my body, my hands laced around his neck. His fingers were tentative, moving down my arms, and you know that term, like putty in his hands. Well, that was me. In that moment. Melting big time. Whatever is bothering you, I find it helps to channel your inner warrior. I wanted to know more about earlier. Seeing him pacing and looking so troubled, my heart dropped a little. He frowned at me, amusement flickering in those sultry green orbs. I sing the eye of the tiger in my head. When I have to face morons, like those pompous buggers in there. I offered him. He laughed, the sound deep, yet melodic. His lips moved against my hairline. Eye of the tiger. Yeah, I mean don't steal my song. I find 80s rock works the best. Something like Kansas, or Journey. Ah, Charlie Daniels, or Travis Tritt. I wouldn't even know if he made those names up I giggled into his neck. His hands found mine, and I felt like I was sixteen again. Except when I was sixteen I was perennially single, attending an all-girls school, and spending half of my life online, staring at photographs of Leonardo DiCaprio. I also had the world's worst fringe. But I digress. I was giddy. 
drunk on his wild west swagger, sinking in the whirlpool of my desire. For him, this is the first time I've stopped anywhere and met someone as interesting as you. His breath fanned my neck, and I swallowed the impending moan that threatened. Interesting. Pa. I pulled away from his fingertips, smoothing out my kiss-crumpled dress. Why did I hate that word so much? Interesting was such a boring word. What's wrong with interesting? My face must have said it all. He closed the distance, taking my hand again and reeling me in. Flush against his body, I wondered whether anyone had ever had their heart jump out of their mouths whilst in of a man. I had images of having to chase it down the garden. And you're beautiful. I don't think I ever blushed as deeply as I did then. Beautiful. Donna was beautiful. Lissa was beautiful. I was one degree above mundane. Normal. Average. And then he tickled me, under the arms, breaking into my moment of embarrassment, and as I thrashed, laughing harder than I had in years, he caught me in his arms, peppering my jawline with kisses. I fought back, tickling him back, and escaped from his arms, dashing up the stone steps towards the Chinese garden. But he was quick, appearing in front of me, as I crossed the bamboo bridge, slick with rainwater. You know how you feel when you're a child. You're playing hide-and-seek and there's this squeal building in your lungs as you anticipate being found. That sheer joy you get, like a mixture of adrenaline and fear and excitement. I felt all those things as he pulled me into his strong arms, guns displayed through his almost see-through shirt, thanks to the downpour. Thank you, downpour. It was one of those moments where laughter seemed so much louder than the rumbling clouds above us, and I realized Donna's suspicions may not be that far off the mark. In fact, she was probably on point. I should get back inside I whispered into his lips as his face hovered millimeters from mine. I didn't sound very firm, but I knew that wedding planner with a stick up her arse would be on my tail. And I knew that the longer I stayed here with him, the more perilous my footing was. Falling in love with a man like him was imminent. A pressing warmth that rifled through me like a hurricane. Letting go of his hand was harder than I imagined it would be, because it felt like if I let go, all of this would just be a figment of my imagination. Let's face it, I wanted to hang into him forever, like a child possessive, clutching a favorite toy and refusing for anyone else to touch it. We rejoined the party, and as soon as I entered, Tarquin accosted me, his face gleeful, a dark liquor in a crystal glass, hanging from his hand, like he was Dean Martin on stage. Ha hello, Shexy, he slurred, winking, and feeling for a solid object to hold into so he didn't career straight into the floor. Well, where did you get to, you naughty girl? Bog off, Tark. I saw you chatting to Dad. Looks like you got what you wanted. I've got work to do. If you don't mind, we should discuss our impending nuptials and con consummating our relation, our engagement. Uh. I left him stuttering and wobbling about, sinking past my dad, who bantered raucously with some stuffy, boring-looking blokes, who nodded at him like those plastic dogs people have in the back of their cars, and didn't even notice me despite me brushing into his arm to avoid. Scott. There were at least two hundred wedding guests, all of which stayed overnight at the manor, and I had to run into him, repeatedly. What were the odds? And yet I never won anything ever. Sam, I have to speak to you? I feel like I can't leave without. At that moment I looked over a sea of heads, unfamiliar faces, some distant relatives, and there was Rat. He was watching, chin raised defiantly, as if sending me a message. Stay strong. Don't let him get to you. Stay strong, Samantha. I'm busy, my voice was disinterested and aloof. I snapped photos of the crowd, holding the camera above my head, and then circled the room, collecting as many different angles as I could. Scott tailed me, 
and I wondered where Miranda was in all of this. I could see Donna now, taking photos of the seven-tier wedding cake. I focused on her. It's about your dad, Sam. Come on. You owe me this? I owe you nothing, I snapped just as we reached where Rhett had been standing. An arm brushed mine, and I felt the warmth of Rhett's fingertips as he gently knotted his digits with mine. I looked into serene pools of earthy green, and he squeezed my fingers gently. Well talk, hissed Scott. He'll catch you later, he mumbled under his breath. Boy's dumber than a box of rocks, Rhett lent in, his breath tickling my ear. You all right, darlin', or you need me to teach that ass a little respect? I shivered at the change in the depth of his voice, the bass traveling down my spine. I'm a big girl, I winked. How about you fetch me that hot chocolate? There were rousing speeches that had everyone standing, people bowing at the feet of my father, as per usual, while he passed me withering looks. For all intents and purposes I was Cinderella, the dowdy servant at this wedding. But today, my dad could glare at me, and Mom could roll her eyes, and Lissa could pass critical judgment about my photography. But I had a prince. Rhett brought me drinks, refilling my glasses, and delivered me a plate of food before the good stuff went from the buffet and I was left with cold meat and stale bread. His presence washed away everybody else, and as I moved onto my digital camera, I felt fingertips prodding my back. So did you bone him? Thank God Rhett had headed back to the buffet line. I spun around to see Donna, wearing a fitted purple silk gown, her hair in tumbling waves. No, I did not. And Donna, you look amazing. She gave the obligatory spin. She was a faster change artist that Britney Spears on stage. I had a feeling she was trying to bag her own wedding fling. I've been working my arse off so you could cop off with the American. She placed on hand on her hip. So tell me you sealed the deal. We kissed again. That's it. That wasn't it at all. Donna's eyes lit up and she jumped on the spot. I was lucky everyone was so involved in their own conversations. They didn't hear Donna's high-pitched squeals. You did something? I can see it. It was hot dawn. Literally, better than sex. I sighed, but it sounded more like a purr, and the cow elbowed me in the ribs. Holy hell, I want a kiss like that. She fanned herself with a napkin shaped like a duck. Tonight, you bugger off with him and it'll carry on working till the happy couple hit the hay. No ifs, ah, buts, madam. Donna, I can't have you working while I know. It's just wrong. My sister would go mental. Or, you stepped in when I had a hangover at least half a dozen times in the last year and worked my early bird shifts at the cafe. And remember that time I was dying of a cold, and you came by with five huge dairy milk chocolate bars, a dozen chick flicks, and a vat of chicken soup. Who cares what Lissa thinks? Let's face it. She only wants pictures of herself, so everything beyond the ceremony ain't making the wedding album anyway. But, told you. No buts. I just expect the play-by-play -play tomorrow. Fine. If it happens, it will happen. You have the craziest imagination. We're just friends, but I didn't believe that. Not anymore. Uh. Stop lying to yourself, Sammers. Now, get your arse up to your room with this. She passed me a yellow plastic bag and folded my arms around it. That's sure fire shag in there. I blinked at her, shaking my head in amusement. Donna, what are you doing? Being the best friend anyone has ever had. Ever. Ever. Go on. I wasn't sure about the sweetheart neckline. I liked straps. I couldn't afford another nip-slip at a family gathering. Been there. Done that. Nor was I sure about the way it hugged me, like it was a second skin. The dress had been wrapped in my little pony paper, with a tag reading, You shall go to the ball. 
How could I not smile at that? I curled my hair, trying to emulate Donna's, do, but my hair never seemed as shiny, and I wound up looking as if I'd been dragged through a hedge backwards. With a slick of red gloss, I exhaled and inspected my reflection. Wow! I was shocked. I didn't feel like me. I looked. Presentable. More than presentable. Granted my hair wasn't exactly red carpet ready. And my nude sling backs weren't the perfect accompaniment. But I felt like a million dollars, as the saying goes. I slammed the door to my room shut and came face to face with Scott. Heaven help me. He threw his hand down on the wall beside me, trapping me with his icy cold eyes. Seven years, Samantha. Oh, for God's sake, Scott. It's over. It's finished. There's nothing you can say that. Your dad paid me, Sam. Move out of my way, Scott. Seriously. And then I heard his words again. They rolled around my head as I made my way down the corridor towards the staircase. Whipping my head around, I saw him standing there, eyes narrowed in my direction. My dad did what? Paid me. Twenty-five thousand pounds. To stop seeing you. I don't, I don't understand. Your mom and dad, you know what they're like. They don't accept you for who you are and they wanted you to rejoin their life. They wanted you to marry some lord and stop embarrassing them. They couldn't do that with me in the picture. They paid you. It was a hard decision. Sam. But your dad knew someone in the book industry. He got me the job I have now. So he gave you a bribe. And you're only telling me this now. I was more than shaken up. I knew how meddling mom and dad could be. I knew what they were like. How dad had shagged his way through countless secretaries and socialites, and the press had never got wind of it. He was clever. He had friends in high places. Some of his business ventures, I'm sure, weren't above board, but he was powerful. And when he wanted something, nothing got in his way. I'd forgotten how backhanded and malicious he could be. Thank God I got away. I couldn't look at Scott. I didn't want anyone right now, other than my bed, at home, and a lifetime supply of jelly sweets. Storming down the stairs, I heard him behind me, Scott calling out for me to stop, telling me that we could talk, that he'd make everything better. But how? I didn't see Rhett standing at the foot of the stairs, or Donna beside him. I just needed to get away. There could have been an elephant wearing a tuxedo in the hallway, and I'd not have noticed. Bloody hell, Scott, what did you say? Donna was climbing the stairs behind me. Her voice was one of fury and loathing. What the effing hell did you say to her, you miserable little scrote? My feet pounded the hallway till I made my way through to the library. I don't know why I chose to end up there, but I flung open the doors and threw myself down on the chaise long. He hadn't loved me. Ever. A man worth his salt would have thrown that money back in Dad's face and told him where to go. He'd have been mortified, disgusted at the thought, and he'd reassure me nothing could ever break us. Instead, he carved out a whole new life for himself. A life that didn't involve me. So I was that easy to forget about. His feelings were that easy to buy. Hey! It was Rhett's voice. He sounded a little strangled and distant. I lifted my head to see him standing by the windows, his expression pained. It'll go, if you want me to. I was gonna help Donna out, but it seems like she's fine on her own, he chuckled, before wiping his mouth and a somber expression replacing the smile. It'll go. I just want you to know that I'm here. If you wanna talk. I nodded, swallowing the angsty, ugly tears. I was ready to cry over my pathetic family, who conspired to take my happiness away from me. Why was I surprised? Is, is my mascara running down my face? Rhett crossed the room and crouched down beside me, checking my eye makeup. His eyes cradled mine, 
and he pushed a curl off my forehead. You look perfect, he whispered. Is that code for you have mascara everywhere? No, he picked up my hand and kissed the back below the knuckles. Donna said she had something to show me, and then there you were on that staircase, looking like heaven's little devil. Oh, Donna, I groaned, face against the cushions. I'm sorry. I'm not, he stroked my back tenderly. I brought us this, he lifted a bottle of whiskey from the floor. It might not be your favorite drink, but tonight I don't want to drink alone, and you look like you need a friend. Tell me about earlier, I had to ask. A problem shared was a problem halved, and I didn't fancy going over my woes. He was forthcoming, speaking freely, almost like a dam had burst and he needed to talk. I had a call from my mom. Haven't seen her in six months, because of work. I haven't been in home. For fourteen months, he swallowed a long glug of whiskey, wiping his mouth with his sleeve. Whoa! I rolled onto my back, looking up at the ceiling. What's that like? He passed me the bottle, and I felt the heat as the liquid slid down my throat. His fingers drew patterns on my palm, lazy movements that brought home the intimacy of this moment. Working away from home. Hell, it's hard. I bet what made you want to travel so much? I needed more alcohol. Tonight I was getting well and truly slaughtered. That is a good question. When I was a kid, I watched my dad working the farm, and that was all I wanted to do. I wanted to be him, raising a family and doing good, honest work. The kind of work that makes your back ache, but you get to watch the fields fill up with sunshine in the mornings and watch the moon over the crops as night falls. And then one day my dad lost his farm. He didn't want to sell. He stood his ground. But the other guy, he was a developer, and he made it impossible for us to stay. Sully Dad's reputation had the mayor on his payroll. Even then, I knew we were just money, a place the guy would never venture out to. He didn't care what happened to us he held onto the bottle, closing his eyes, as he sought comfort at the bottom of the bottle. I'm so sorry I sat up, Rhett still on the floor beside me, and I stroked his cheek his eyes fixed on the Persian carpet beneath him. I'm so sorry, Rhett. That sounds awful. Did your dad find another job? Did you find somewhere else to live? I took the whiskey from him, pressing the cool glass against my lips. Yeah, we found a little house in Kent. It needed a lot of work, but me and my brothers, we helped our mom. Dad got sick that winter, and every day he just seemed weaker. He died the day after Christmas. Heart attack? I moved down onto the floor and clasped his hand in mine. Oh, God, that's awful, Rhett. I rested my forehead against his arm, and he filtered his fingers through my curls. That's why I travel, I guess. I wanted to find a job whereby I could pay Mom's bills, but I find it damned hard being there sometimes, going back home. Because you miss your dad. I miss a lot of things. Staying away makes it easier, you know. I know, I murmured, thinking of how much more in control I felt away from my family. It was a different situation, but I'd probably do the same if I'd walked in his shoes. It didn't bear thinking about. Nothing I'd been through could rival the pain his family must have been dragged through. All so someone could make apartment blocks on their land. I took another slug from the bottle, wincing at the burn. The booze was taking effect now, and I wanted to hold him more than I wanted him to hold me. Bugger being nervous naked. With every tuff his hands on my skin, I fell a little harder for him. And it felt like now, or never, come back to my room with me. I uttered, locking my eyes with his. Please. He kissed my palm, his cheeks reddened from the alcohol. Or oh, maybe the lust that I felt too, pooling between my thighs with heady urgency. Let's go. He drawled, setting every inch of me ablaze. I was drunk, and he wasn't far off either. It wasn't the Hollywood sex scene I wanted, that I imagined, as we kissed earlier.
There were no confessions of love, a hot, steamy shower, as we discovered one another's bodies and gasped in awe. There was no slow, torturous undressing, or repeat sessions that carried on through the night and into the wee hours. I didn't want to be alone, and I knew that tonight, neither did he. The only memory I had was of clumsy limbs falling between the sheets and the feeling of his arms around me. But little else. I had slept with the man of my dreams. And I remembered bugger all. My brain was a mush, a throbbing headache combined with a pressing hunger after my liquid diet last night. I didn't even like whiskey. What was wrong with me? I touched the cool cotton sheet beside me, his cologne fragrancing the air, and I knew he wasn't there. Instantly. I knew. But the footsteps in the bathroom told me he was freshening up. My heart soared, and I bit my lip, thinking of all the ways I could make it up to him today. I grabbed my fake Gucci handbag off the bedside table and found my mirror. As I suspected, I looked like Frankenstein's bride. And I also needed a wee. Scrubbing my skin with a rogue baby wipe, I applied some mascara and lip gloss, and then brushed my hair into a ponytail. I would have preferred the tousled, yet designer bedhead look, but my hair had grown twice its normal size in the night. Rearranging the sheets, I spotted my lanyard on his pillow, which was odd, because I could have sworn I'd left it on the dressing table when I got slipped into the red bodycon number last night. I blushed as I noticed a trail of my clothing all over the bedroom floor. I wanted to remember last night. I wanted every moment replayed. Over and over and over. I heard the shower turn on and then off, and the sound of whistling. I smiled to myself, stroking his pillow, just as the bathroom door opened and a woman stepped out, holding a mop, bucket, and bottles of cleaning fluids. Oh, gosh! I'm so sorry! I thought you'd left with your husband. I couldn't see anything moving in the bed, and there was no do-not-disturb sign. Oh, dearie, I'm ever so sorry. What do you mean left with my husband? The middle-aged woman frowned. The tall gentleman, blonde, green eyes, he left a few hours ago. Left? Yes. He checked out, which I thought was unusual, because Mr. Belvedere booked the manor for a week. Of course. I sounded hollow. I felt hollow. But I had no idea he had intentions of leaving today. And a cold, dark shadow fell over me. Stupid, really. But it felt bereft. Sorry for disturbing you. The woman had kind eyes. She reminded me of a school dinner lady. No, no, it's okay. There had to be a note. An explanation. He'd gone out probably to get me breakfast. That was it. Maybe pizza. Perhaps he'd arrive with that pearly white grin and a box in his hand, and we'd climb back into bed for the day. So why had he checked out? I tripped over my shoes, slamming my knee into the dressing table. It hurt. Jumping up and down in pain, I scoured the bedroom for a little slip of paper that might explain why he'd left so suddenly. If I hadn't been so drunk, I'd probably have been awake. I'd have noticed him getting up. I could have coaxed him back under the covers. Held him till he fell asleep once more. This was all Scott's fault. And my parents. Why had I tainted this experience with booze? Had I not learnt anything in life? I dropped to my busted knees, looking under the bed. But all I found were spare blankets and my knickers from last night. Wonderful. A lovely reminder of possibly the best night of my life, and I remember diddly squat. Flopping down on the bed, I called Donna. She'd know what to do. Everything would be okay. She looked like she hadn't slept a wink, rambling about falling asleep in the marquee after too many cocktails with the manor staff. The usual well-turned-out Donna looked rough and disheveled. I'd have laughed, if I wasn't feeling so melancholy this morning. He can't be gone. She reassured me. He's just popped out, Sam. Probably to get you another pizza. 
it is midday after all. Great minds think alike. Then why did he check out? I had to say yet. And there had to be an answer for it. Donna would know. She'd clear this up. My mind was just running away with itself. He checked out. Yes. He's gone. Before we jump to assumptions, we have to speak to the front of house. See what they say. Maybe he looked like he was checking out, but maybe he wasn't. She sat down next to me, taking my hand. Run through everything that happened last night. You went to the library, right? I bumped into you before you headed upstairs. Did you? We were talking and drinking, and then we ended up here. I do remember us taking selfies in the hallway. I got up and wandered towards the dressing table to retrieve my cameras. But I frowned as I picked up my digital. The memory card slot was hanging open. Similarly, the back of my vintage Nikon was also wide open. I wouldn't have left them this way. Even if I was rat arse drunk, something was very wrong here. He robbed me. I muttered. The realization hitting me like a plank of wood to the face. Donna stood up behind me, in her crumpled ball gown. What? He robbed me. Oh, someone did. The memory card is gone. And so is the film Where's Your Camera, Don? Please say it's safe. Please say you have it. Her eyes widened. I gave you the memory card. When we bumped into one another last night, Lissa and her husband went to bed early. Your dad booked them a surprise luxury cruise on his yacht, so I wasn't needed anymore. You gave me the memory card. Yes. You were snogging the face-off rat. I thought you'd want to get them edited together. I scanned the room, heart pounding, stomach churning. My camera bag is gone. I had all the film from yesterday in it. At least five rolls. And probably your memory card. Why would he take the pictures? It makes no sense, babe. I don't know. I don't have a clue. Well, we should call the police. Or the manor staff. They can check their footage. I can't let Lissa know. Oh, God. Her wedding pictures are gone. I was supposed to do one thing. One simple thing. The other guests will have pictures. We can just blag it. No. Lissa was adamant nobody take any images. She wanted to keep the detail of her dress and the wedding secret for the magazine deal. We were the only ones taking pictures, Don. Oh, God. What have I done? Boy. Listen. This is probably just a misunderstanding. He was drunk too, right? So something came up at work, and he was all groggy and he accidentally took the cards and the film. These things happen. You can't accidentally open the backs of cameras, Donna. I've cocked up yet again. Nobody will be surprised. I may as well stroll down to my mom and dad's room and tell them. Right now. No. You aren't going anywhere. We'll find the picture, Sam. Since when do you throw in the towel at the first hurdle? Since the man of my dreams decided to rob me of the chance at proving myself to my family. There I was, freaking hook, line, and sinker, completely in love with a stranger. Just leave me alone, Donna. I'm a mess. I'm not worth anyone's time. Scott was paid to dump me, and he figured he'd rather have money than me. And then this guy comes along that seems to get me. Me, and my stupid brain and chubby body, I was a stupid idiot. Sammers. Donna hugged me tightly. You and me? Okay. Sisters before misters. You're not chubby, or stupid. Call yourself that one more time and I'll wallop you. We'll think of something. Now, let's get dressed and have breakfast and then we can investigate. Investigate. The robbery. If you don't want the police involved, and you don't want to tell anyone well, we'll have to do it ourselves, she said, decisively. Rat. My contact met me at Heathrow Airport, in the corner booth at Starbucks. He didn't meet my eyes, but he placed a thick manila envelope on the table. 
They always carried cash, too much risk of a paper trail otherwise. And some of these guys weren't always into legal work, shall we say. I checked the time on my Rolex. He was punctual to the second. Good work, Christopher. He gestured in my direction. Some deemed the local network impenetrable, but I knew we could rely on you. My client will be pleased. I nodded curtly, stuffing the money into the pocket of my leather jacket. I knew I was good, a whole career built on playing dirty, going the extra mile where my fellow, hackers, feared to tread. When you have nothing, you have nothing to lose. That's the crux of it all. I trust you got all the info you needed. I swirled my coffee, watching the cocoa pattern disappear into the froth. And then some. You were very thorough. Monsieur Belvedere will regret being so distracted at his daughter's wedding the man sneered, extracting heavily mirrored sunglasses from his suit pocket. It was a pleasure to meet a man of your technology prowess, Mr. Brody. He left as quickly as he appeared, just like they always did. Some of the guys I worked for were nothing more than ghosts. Rich ghosts. I nursed the cappuccino I'd ordered, but it never tasted like it did back home. My heavy eyes were drawn to my briefcase, where I'd deposited the memory cards and packets of film. I didn't know what I was going to do with them. I just knew if Belvedere's security team checked into the wedding, I didn't want to be in any of the images. I had studied the layout and security camera locations of the manor weeks ago. It paid to be diligent and thorough. I'd ensured that the cameras were taken offline for the duration of my stay, and the flooding kept any would-be engineers at bay. The unpredictable British weather played right into my hands. I'd managed to avoid conversation with almost everyone at the manor. Except her. Samantha. I blew the steam off the cup, shutting my eyes for a second, and instead of banishing her image, I just seemed to see her more. Dark hair, dark eyes, naturally red lips, that faint taste of raspberry. Samantha Belvedere. Rumor had it the eldest daughter of the family lived in Eastern Europe, that she was into charity work and painted for a living. She hadn't been seen in years and no images existed online, on any of the usual social networking sites. She wasn't expected to attend the wedding. I knew. I'd seen the guest list. I slid one of the memory cards out of my bag and placed it into the South Dakota slot on my laptop. Within seconds, wedding photographs filled my screen. And pictures of us? What was I doing? I enlarged one, but it was stupid. I don't know why I did it. Her eyes were so arresting that I felt like my throat was closing up. First woman that got me like this, and she was the enemy. Closing the picture down and slamming the computer, shut I saw a woman nearby, pass me a questioning look. Everyone was suspicious in airports. My hands shook as I ran them over my face. Keep cool, Rat. Ain't nobody rattled you like this. Ever. Idiot. How could I be stupid enough to get suckered in by a Belvedere? At 5 a.m., I'd stumbled to the dressing table in some haze of liquor to pour myself a glass of water. And I saw her name tag. The kind of thing a nurse wears on a bright red ribbon. Everything hit me at once. The photos I'd seen of her as a child, her talking to her mother in the parlor, the bridesmaid's dress. It was right there, and I hadn't seen it. The woman I'd been falling for, under some invisible but undeniable force, the first person I'd connected within forever. I didn't know whether it was the liquor, but hours earlier I'd been ready to ask that girl to leave her life behind and never look back. Some impromptu, spontaneous act, based on feeble human emotions. I wanted to be with her like I needed her something chronic. I'd never met anyone like her in my whole life. And there I was, sleeping with the enemy. Samantha. His room turned up no clues, but the cleaning lady did insist we leave before she called for security after we turned the room upside down. I'll admit I was feeling quite revved up, 
when I overturned his mattress, looking for some hidden snippet of information, and she wasn't too impressed with having to remake the bed. I think she swore at me in Polish. Our next stop was the front desk, and Donna turned on her charms to check Rhett's details. The skinny teenage clerk didn't have a chance in hell of saying no, as she pressed her cleavage against the mahogany desk. I think he'd probably have signed away his life savings right then and there. It was immediately obvious that Rhett had lied about his identity. Donna's flirting gave us the name of the former occupant of the Coleridge suite, Christopher Brody. His surname was the same. He'd just invented himself a new Christian name. But the question was, why? The more I thought about all of this, the angrier and more confused I felt. Sadness welled in my chest, but the anger took the edge off, giving me a welcome adrenaline kick. I missed whoever I'd shared yesterday with, the guy who bought me a pizza and soothed me with a kiss. Donna took her bags up to my room as I sat in the library, trying to figure out my next move, and I resisted ordering myself a drink. He could be anywhere in the world right now. Everything he'd told me could have been a lie, some fabrication to get what he wanted. He was a con man. He'd been stringing me along the whole time, and like Scott he'd had no intentions of sticking around once he had what he'd come for. I'd barely eaten all day and that wasn't like me. The day Scott walked out, I must have eaten half, the local Indian takeaway, and two M.C. Donald's meals. In the shortest space of time, I'd convinced myself that Rhett was different. Because he was pretty and sweet and liked a lump of a woman like me. How utterly naive can you get? Pacing around the library floor my mind whizzed and whirred. I thought about the way men had always defined my life. As a child, I always sought dad's affections and never got anywhere. It made me into a comfort eater with low self-esteem. Then Scott, with all the promises of a family and marriage, and he'd ultimately decided he'd prefer a chunk of cash and a lucrative job opportunity over the life we'd always told ourselves was our ultimate dream. I'd been granted no closure from that relationship, not till now, and I'd been wandering around in a daze. This funk I was never able to escape. Dead end jobs and one night stands, and a whole lot of wine. Rhett was right about one thing. I let them do this to me. And then of course there was the cowboy. I saw him as a turning point, the moment where my luck changed. Even if he'd had to go we'd still have had this incredible romance out here in beautiful Cairo. But it wasn't that simple. He'd robbed me of the chance to shine with my photography, and in the end I knew he'd do more damage than Scott ever did. Because I wanted him with every fiber of my being, I wanted to be the girl who got her happy ending with a dishy southern boy. It was after an hour of wearing holes in the floor pacing, while Donna watched from the doorway, that it came to me. My eyes rested on that chaise long, and I realized he had been a turning point. The point where I don't take anybody's crap anymore. The point where I realize that the only person holding me back in life is me. And I may not have a loving family, a husband, or a cherub-like son called Gabriel. But I do have Donna. Don, I've got a credit card in the back of my purse. My rainy day card. I think it's coming out to play, I blurted out, a surge of confidence racing through me. Oh, retail therapy. Donna squealed. Where are we going? America, I announced with determination. To a little town called Kent. Rhett. Hey, Mom. I was about to set foot onto a plane destined for Prague. A client wanted to meet with me before I jetted off to a job in Sydney, Australia. As always, he wanted dirt on a competitor, and I was the man prepared to go to any lengths to retrieve the intel. I stopped by the departures board to answer the call, and my heart leapt and sank as a woman about Samantha's height and hair color walked past me. I gritted my teeth, exhaling loud enough to startle a guy, stood next to me in a safari hat. 
he sidled away, eager to put distance between us. Rhett, are you okay? Since I was a baby, my family always called me Rhett. I'd been named Christopher at birth, like my father, but they always called me Rhett at home. And it stuck. I paused, watching the brunette chatting on the phone. I thought about Samantha and resisted the urge to punch something. Because she'd gotten inside my head. Two days, and she was part of every other thought. Rhett, honey. Yeah. Everything worked out okay here. I, uh, I was thinking of coming home. Here. When? Are you okay, honey? You're not in trouble. I could hear the concern that she offered me, and it felt like sunshine after a really bitter winter. I'm fine, Mom. I smiled. Hearing her voice always made things a hundred times better. I'm gonna finish up here, but it'll see you soon, okay? Soon. Soon. I promised, before hanging up the phone and getting ready to leave Britain behind, and I hoped every memory of Samantha, too. Samantha. Getting home was a barrel of laughs. Of course I'm being sarcastic. It was the most miserable journey I'd ever been on, and that's saying something. I'd once journeyed to Egypt with my family, as an eight-year-old, enduring scorching heat, and some monotone guide rambling on about ancient artifacts. When you're a child you couldn't care less about carvings or hieroglyphics. You just want an ice cream, a pool, and a water slide. This holiday had none of those things. Being stuck in a jeep with my family, while we ventured to some remote location, without air conditioning, was akin to torture. Add into the mix my sister and mother singing operatic tunes, shrill and completely out of tune, and my father clapping, shouting bravo every time they finished. They did not sound remotely worth his praise, and he only encouraged them to outdo one another with their high-pitched catawal wailing. Today, was turning out to be one calamity after another, and almost had me pining for that bumpy jeep ride across the desert. The water levels had risen outside the manor, my car now swimming with dirty, smelly water. I caught the distinct waft of fish, and something decomposing, and that was enough for me to slam the door and write the car off. I had hoped to drive the rust bucket off the estate somehow, picking my way over the flower beds, and rejoining the road further down. But I wasn't exactly an expert driver, definitely more wacky racers than Michael Schumacher. Everyone else had moved their vehicles in some act of genius, and I spotted Tarquin's car up on the grassy verge beside the manor. So nice of everyone to notify me, don't you think? My car was the only vehicle left, steeped in water, and probably suffering irreparable damage, to the already dodgy engine. Waiting out with our suitcases, getting totally drenched, I was angrier than ever at Rhett, the stupidly beautiful cunning cowboy. He'd obviously experienced the wonders of British weather this morning, but he was that eager to get away with his loot that he'd trudged through slime and overflowing drains to escape from me. Lucky Lissa had Dad's helicopter fly in especially, just to speed her off to her all-expenses-paid honeymoon, and here I was waist-deep in murky water, my favorite boots, filled to the brim, and soon to be resigned to the bin, and Donna trying desperately to chase after her left shoe, which was currently floating ahead of her. I joined in the chase, gagging at the sour sewage stench. Once we'd reached the road, both of us freezing cold, and smelling more disgusting than a wet dog, we attempted to flag down a car. But looking like swamp people didn't help, nor did my insistence that knowing our luck a serial killer would stop and seal our fate. Suddenly hitchhiking didn't seem like the best idea. In the end we got on a bus to the train station after the driver laid down newspapers for us, so we didn't soak his seats through. Cue some very disgruntled fellow travelers at the disruption to their journey, and us being utterly mortified. And I could still smell that putrid fishy smell. I was sure everyone else could too. Gag. We missed our train down south by three minutes, 
and spent the rest of the day snapping at one another, till we sat at opposite ends of our taxi on the way back to my flat, scowling at the windows, pulling up at the door to my building after the longest day in history. Donna grabbed my arm and stabbed the dirty taxi window, with an even dirtier finger, her chipped painted blue nails grubby, from our bare grills-like day. I squinted through the barely transparent glass. Standing arms crossed at my door. In some stuffy cable-knitted sweatshirt was none other than Tarquin. What the hell was he doing here? Samantha. Hello, dear. I was reminded of the Bond villain sitting in a swivel chair, stroking some plush cat with evil green eyes. Tarquin sneered from behind his impressive overbite, leaning into my doorway, eyes fixed squarely on me. Tarquin, move your arse. My patience was wearing thin even with Donna today, so I wasn't exactly in the mood for Mr. Winky and his irritating innuendos, and my sheer revulsion for him. Darling, that's no way to talk to your fiancé. He chided, wagging his finger and riling me up, so much I considered going all Jackie Chan on his undoubtedly lily-white arse. Just stop it. Seriously. I'll deck you. She will. Donna agreed. Step aside short arse before you land on it. I know all about your Cagney and Lacey act today. Ladies. He winked, wiggling his eyebrows like they were two unruly caterpillars. Seems you were so engrossed in your bumbling investigation that you were unaware of my presence. What? My eyes moved from Tarquin to Donna, who was shooting daggers at him. I'd never seen her look so intimidating. But she was a good foot taller than the goblin. I questioned that kind fellow at the front desk, paid him a little for his time. He gave me enough information. He said you two were ranting about stolen photos. He heard wrong. I blurted, narrowing my eyes at him, my cheeks beginning to burn. Oh, really, his grin widened. So you aren't planning on tailing the American and recovering the stolen memory cards, and I presume rolls of film, he pilfered from you. My mouth dropped open, and that smug look on his face broadened. I run my own business, a very successful business at that, Samantha dear. I also own three publications a gardening magazine, a mother and baby monthly, and a lifestyle magazine. I knew what was coming. You own the magazine. The deal Lissa had it was with you. Oh, you're quick to catch on, he murmured, sarcastically. And as we both have vested interests in these photos, it seems logical that I accompany you girls. Hell no. In my head I heard Rhett's voice. Hell nah. That drawl. That lazy, drawn-out soft, gravelly timber. I closed my eyes, blinking away the image of him standing there, instead of Tarquin, hands hooked into the belt loops of his jeans, green eyes swirling with sensuality. But of course when I opened my eyes Tarquin was still there and Rhett was still a conniving dirt bag, not the knight in shining armor that I'd built up in my deluded imagination. I don't think you have a choice. Lissa is one phone call away. I'll tell her that you were sucked into a fomance and once again cocked up. Isn't that the terminology you'd use, Samantha dear? I think you underestimate me. I can make life very difficult for you. It's your choice. I was seething. You know when people say they see red, well I really did. If Donna hadn't been there I'd have attempted a feeble punch at Tarquin's face. I'd never hit anyone in my life. In my head, I'd look like Jean-Claude Van Damme, and in reality, I'd probably career forwards and bang my head on the door, knock myself out and wind up in an E with concussion. Okay, Tarquin. You can come with us. But you let us do this our way. And if you say a word I'll come, after Udana was brave, standing so close to him that their chests touched. I heard a whimper, and realized it was Tarker's as Donna stared him down. I'm from the ghetto, Tarquin. You've never met anyone like me, and trust me, you don't want to feel my wrath. And suddenly I saw Donna's way of thinking. K. 
keep your enemies close. I didn't need Tarquin running off to my mom at a time like this. Let alone Lissa. And maybe we could use him? Tarquin gulped, and I almost felt sorry for him, almost. I felt laughter building in my chest as Donna dominated the poor sod. Well, um, I'm glad you see things my way he moved away from her, feeling along the wall, as if plotting an escape route. Why don't we go upstairs and discuss the finer details of our expedition? Tarquin suggested, trying to get the upper hand again. Expedition. Typical Tarquin lingo. I suppose it was, really. There was no guaranteeing he'd return home, but it was the only lead we had. I pushed past our unlikely traveling companion and unlocked the door, kicking aside a small collection of bills. I'd been gone a matter of days, and when that time three lovely-looking envelopes sat there with their silent demands for money. But they could wait. I had bigger, more important fish to fry. Rat. Due to adverse weather conditions, all flights across Europe have been cancelled. I looked up, as if speaking to the nasal, sounding woman over the loudspeaker. You've got to be kidding me. Raking my fingers over my hair, I exhaled. I just wanted to be shot of this island, immersed into work again, letting algorithms and HTML distract me from remembering the scent of her shampoo. Oh, the feeling of her bare skin. I leant back in the hard plastic chair in the departure's lounge. Flights have been rescheduled for tomorrow morning. The nasal woman broke into my thoughts and stole away my chance at leaving. For another 24 hours, at least. Outside rain battered the runway, and I considered calling in a favor from one of my wealthy friends, but even they wouldn't risk landing their aircraft in what was dubbed the worst storm in the past 250 years. Before I arrived I was aware it rained a lot in England, but I didn't bank on this. This deluge was worse than anything I'd ever seen, and I just wanted to be gone. Thousands of feet up in the air, putting miles between me and the Belvedere clan. For years, I'd been waiting for the chance to exact my revenge on Benedict Belvedere, a man with an empire so vast he owned land in almost every inhabited country in the world. He was so powerful that he was able to keep his indiscretions out of the press, bankrolling so many media outlets that he controlled what they printed. But I'd followed him, I'd seen the women he seduced in seedy clubs, the hundreds of times he'd spent his weekends at a villa in Monte Carlo with a bevy of beauties young enough to be his daughters. His daughter, I massaged my temples, reminding myself that I'd known the broad for less than 48 hours. Reminding myself that whatever I felt wasn't real. Whatever I felt was nothing more than a response to contact after being so isolated for so long. I was sure any psychologist worth their salt would second that thought. When the job came up in England it felt close to fate, getting the chance to somehow hit the bastard right where it hurt. The only place it could ever hurt for him. In his pocket. There were encrypted files on his laptop, a job only I could do. It took every ounce of strength, I had not to drag the son of a bitch into the woods and settle this thing like men. I dreamed of facing off with the arrogant socialite, but I knew my dad wouldn't approve of violence. Sometimes it was necessary in my job, hell I'd been in a few scrapes, I'd gotten my ass hooped, and I'd handed out a hooping when I needed to get out of a situation fast. People didn't take too kindly to others, sneaking into their supposed airtight security systems and causing havoc. I got up and paced the lounge, knowing I had to make a choice. Check into a hotel for tonight, or sleep here. Here was a lot more appealing. I was used to airports. They all looked the same no matter what continent you stood on. Those clinical white walls, covered in posters advertising duty-free perfume and fine chocolates. The businessmen like me, wandering up and down on the phone, looking but not seeing, lost in their own worlds. The families excited about heading somewhere overseas, 
a gaggle of children following their parents, with pull-along suitcases shaped like farm animals. The skiers, the surfers, the worried women with drawn faces as they returned back home, wherever home was, to nurse a sick relative. Airports had always been comforting, that feeling of being anonymous, everybody was somewhere to be. But I didn't feel comforted much. Not today. I trawled the stores, a mass of designer bags, made by kids in some third world country, candy in tins shaped like Big Ben and suitcases. One thing I'll never understand is why they sell luggage at the airport. You'd have to pay more to take it home, and there's no way the standoffish air crew would allow you to take your new purchase as carry-on. I found myself in a drugstore, aimlessly wandering amongst hand cream and those blow-up pillows that are supposed to make traveling more comfortable, but in reality, make you feel like you're being slowly strangled. I moved past an orange-colored woman wearing so much makeup, I didn't know whether she was attending a clown convention or didn't own a mirror. And then I saw them. Rows and rows of them. Raspberry lip balm. Before my brain cells engaged and analyzed what I was doing, I was standing in front of a bemused, looking Asian guy with hands full of lip balm. As he rung up the order I heard myself mutter quietly, but not silent enough that the Asian guy didn't hear me say, I have dry lips. Really dry lips. Shit. Samantha. I sat between Donna and Tarquin, a map laid out across our laps. There's a place called Kent in New York, Donna exclaimed excitedly, prodding the map with her finger, so hard she nearly went right through it. That has to be it, and we can go shopping and... There's also a Kent in Ohio, Tarquin pointed out. His accent was not that of a New Yorker. He rolled his eyes at Donna, and I saw the venom in her as she turned to face him. And how would you know? Donna raised a confrontational eyebrow. Are you an expert on accents? There was a definite atmosphere in here. As much as I disliked O.L., Tark, Donna seemed even less taken with him. Donna, he's right. He's not from New York. Oh! She crossed her arms and sulked into her seat. I wanted to go to New York. To be honest, so did I. But at the same time, I'd go to whatever lengths necessary to take back what was mine. I called up Google on my laptop, fingers shaking as I conducted my investigation. There's also a Kent in Washington, I sighed. This is hopeless. We could track down Brodus in every Kent, and it's such a common name, we'd probably find loads. If his name is even Brody, this is like looking for a needle in a huge haystack. There's probably a lot more Kents, too. Tarquin trailed off, running his finger over the map. Thanks, Tarquin. I hissed. So you're just here to state the bloody obvious now, are you? And elevate my stress that little bit more. Sammy, darling, utilize me. What? He was looking at me with the same pervy look head worn during our meal together. He was probably referring to something sexual involving his winky. Use me, Sammy. Exploit me. Violate me for your every need. His hand snaked up my thigh, and I swatted him away, like the annoying fly he was. Seriously, he'd end up flying from the window in a minute, and he kept referring to this impromptu trip as a jaunt. Insufferable twit. Tarquin, you have contacts, right? Donna stood up, dusting off imaginary crumbs from her temporary outfit. I hadn't done the laundry before I left, so all I had were pajamas and beachwear. She wore a sarong and a stretched SpongeBob t-shirt, and I wore a Winnie the Pooh, nighty, and bright red beach shorts. Fetching. Very fetching. Of course, dear. Now Tarquin was grinning suggestively at Donna. Didn't he know she could turn all Hulk on his arse in a matter of milliseconds? They were talking, or rather brawling, snapping at one another, while I lost myself in my thoughts, desperately clawing at a memory of last night. 
My mind was whirring, a haze of booze and hormones, until I remembered something, and I could see him like he was standing in front of me, leaning into the doorway, that Colgate smile and rugged handsomeness, driving my heart close to a coronary. Haven. I ran my fingers through my knotty matted hair, or rather tried to. Haven. He said something about a lake and woods and... I thought you said Kent Donna inquired, looking at me like I was losing the plot. And maybe I was. No Kent was my only clue. I was prepared to go there and ask some questions and find out where the family moved to he said his hometown was Kent. But his family moved and last night, he said something about a lake and woods and haven. I don't know if I made it up, I mean that wouldn't be unlike me. Heaven or haven? Donna asked, one hand on her hip, looking at me with an expression that showed she was less than convinced that I'd remembered the name right. Then again she had seen me last night and given me her memory card. And I remembered nothing. Haven, Tarquin murmured as he tapped away at his iPad. He was silent for a moment before looking up, victory dancing in his eyes. And then he leapt from his chair, doing this weird jig that reminded me of a leprechaun. Bingo! Arrange our transport, Tarquin. I commanded him, a mixture of excitement and trepidation brewing in my stomach. We leave as soon as we can. Wait! Where are we going? Donna looked bewildered. We're headed to the south, Miss Donna, said Tark, in a very convincing drawl of his own. And believe it or not, I managed to smile at him. In this. She motioned to her mismatching clothing and looked at me with despair. But for once I didn't care what anyone else thought as I ventured out on this mission. Because I was going to retrieve those photographs, in my pajamas, no matter what the cost. Time for a showdown with the cowboy. Samantha. I'm not traveling with Tavagrant's Tarquin sulked turning his back on us and pacing around in a huff. He reminded me of a grumpy toddler. I half expected him to stamp his feet and throw himself backwards while strangers tutted. Then leave. I challenged him. Keep your mouth shut and forget everything we've discussed today. Fair enough. I knew he was calling my bluff. He'll ask my pilot to leave. He straightened the lapel of his stupidly stuffy jacket and lifted his chin haughtily. Your pilot. Did he really say that? Donna looked from me to Tarquin, and I could see the cogs turning in her head. Donna hated traveling on planes, because we were always seated in front of children, who made it their mission to kick in the backs of our seats. Yes. My private jet awaits I was instructed to arrange transportation. He stays. Donna jumped in, giving Tarquin a curt nod and narrowing her eyes at me in a look that said don't challenge me. And I agree with him, I'm all for your gung-ho attitude, babe. I really am, but we look like lunatics. You do? Echoed Tarquin, and scored himself another menacing look from both of us, this time. Back off, ladies. He chuckled, holding out his hands and scanning the airport. I believe there are outlets that cater for tourists, and those wishing to purchase a designer garment on their travels. If you'll both promise to throw away the hideous threads, you're both sporting, then I promise to provide you both with suitable attire for the journey. Ill by my own. I clipped shoving past him. I looked back at Donna as she splayed out her hands and gave me a withering look. If a man offers to buy me clothes, then who am I to turn him down? So whilst Donna fawned over Gucci, I headed to an outdoor clothing store that was only marginally cheaper. The clothes looked like the kind of thing an old married couple called Margaret and Ken might wear on safari, all cocky and with thousands of pockets and shapeless tent-like dresses. In the end, I grabbed a selection of plain vest tops and skirts. Thankfully, for some reason, airports sell suitcases and so I bought a plain black pull-along number and shoved my new purchases inside. My poor Minnie Mouse case, 
was sadly destined for the bin after the epic journey I'd put her through. Wearing an outfit I hoped didn't scream old age pensioner, I bumped into Donna, who was decked out, like Audrey Hepburn, in a dress worthy of the red carpet and sky-high heels that made me look like a troll in comparison. With the eye of the tiger running through my head and a pocket full of spot, inducing sweets, we set off for America, the most mismatched threesome in the history of mankind. Tarquin spent half the flight arguing with Donna about absolutely anything. And I mean anything. From food likes and dislikes to holiday destinations. And I spent the whole flight blocking the pair of them out while my mind went on a planning mission. If this was a movie, the soundtrack would be some belting heavy metal tune right now, as I looked into the camera with sheer determination. Somewhere along the line, aboard Tarquin's private jet, I fell asleep. Either it was the ridiculously gourmet meal the stewardess served, scallops and fondant potatoes somehow cooked at this altitude, not exactly the dried-out reconstituted slop you get on British Airways. Oh, it was my subconscious trying to escape from the increasingly shrill sound of Tarquin's voice and Donna trying to outscreech him. I gave up on refereeing their duel and woke up as our plane hit the tarmac. The plane lurched forwards, sending my laptop spinning across the cabin. I jumped up after it, but even I knew I'd lose this battle. The plane hadn't stopped moving and I flew forwards, holding out my hands and impressively skating across the floor, spotting pieces of broken plastic as I crashed into the toilet door. I don't know why I felt the need to chase after my eight-year-old computer. The thing took ten minutes to boot up, and now I'd grazed my hands in the pursuit. Bloody thing. The plane juddered again, and I felt a weight fall on me. Donna. Sorry, love, I was trying to catch you. And then she whipped her head around, brows furrowed, as we both realized Tarquin laid on top of her. She wriggled away, causing Tarquin to fall down on top of me, squishing my boob with his left hand. Oh, I... I recoiled, dragging myself out from under him. That's my boob. Consider yourself lucky, babe. He was dry humping me. Donna muttered, dusting herself off. I was not. Tarquin snapped, straightening out his shirt. I was trying to stop you smashing your face into the floor. He folded his arms, raising his chin sulkily. Ira! Donna paused, and I could tell she was about to deliver a cutting insult. You're a cock weasel. Donna spat at him, folding her own arms and narrowing her eyes till she looked as terrifying as I'd ever seen her. I tried my hardest not to laugh at her attempt at an insult and took a deep breath. We were here. I didn't know what to expect. Would I hear banjos the instant the plane door opened? Would we pass old wooden houses with elderly gentlemen sitting out on the porch chewing on grass and rocking in creaky rocking chairs? And more importantly, would I find Rhett? When the plane doors opened it was obvious we were in the middle of nowhere. The kind of middle of nowhere you see in films, an expanse of land that seems to stretch a million miles in every direction. And then the plane turned around and left, leaving us on a dirt road, with our new suitcases, and Tarquin. I felt like running after the bloody thing, dramatically, my arms waving in the air. This was a stupid idea anyway, wasn't it? Isn't there an airport? Donna asked, turning 360 degrees and looking across the dry dusty fields. Because this looks like something out of a horror film. The one where the girls go backpacking and weird men, dragging their knuckles, start picking them off. Tarquin interjected. And to my surprise, she didn't knee him in the crotch. I'd have kneed him in the crotch. Yeah, that one. The one where the woman runs about in her nightie in the field and kills the weird men with a spade. Tarquin finished. I couldn't help but feel like I was witnessing a moment between them. But then what did I know about moments? I thought I'd had plenty of those with Rhett, or Christopher, or whatever the hell his name was. Up and down like the British weather, 
that's me, and Donna must have noticed that I was currently on a downer, because she strapped her arm around me and took charge. I think we head that way, Donna said, decisively, pointing towards a line of brown leaf trees. I have a good feeling about that way. Oh, let's go off feeling, shall we? Much more accurate than a compass and a map. Tarquin scoffed. If ever there was a time for a knee to the crotch, it was now. I could see steam coming from Donna's ears, but she was a better woman than me because she didn't rise to it. Tarquin squatted down on the dry earth, like he was bare grills, opening his backpack, and by the looks of things he'd traveled a fair few miles with the thing. It was ratty and worn, and not at all in keeping with his preppy look. He pulled out a map and a compass, laying the map out on the ground. I'd concede to him here. I thought he was just a Weasley bloke, with the personality of a plank of wood, but he seemed to know what he was doing. He ummed and awed, putting his hand to his forehead as he looked out into the distance. Donna is right. Told you cockweasel. Do you mind using my name? Oh, so your name isn't cockweasel. Donna smiled, sarcastically. I thought you were hard work, Tarquin grimaced at me. This one is a bear of love laughs. Let's just get going, please. I don't want to be out here. For too long I pleaded with them both, looking across the barren landscape. I'd rather not be at the mercy of knuckle-dragging weirdos. Two miles turned into four, but we found some semblance of civilization as we hit an actual road, and not the dusty, sandy, stony earth we'd been walking on. Donna regretted those sky-high heels, winding up barefoot for some of the journey, before Tarquin started rambling about the snakes native to the area, and her shoes went back on. For the last mile, Donna somehow wound up on the back of tiny Tarquin, while I dragged both our cases and wore Tarquin's smelly old backpack. It smelled like wet dog and sweat. If I wasn't already feeling queasy from our epic walk, the stench tipped me over the edge, and I wanted a soft bed, a cuddle, and for someone to stroke my hair and tell me I looked pretty. Not that I did. I probably stank twice as bad as Tarquin's backpack. The petrol station was both a cause for excitement and a cause for concern. Excitement, because it was the first building we'd seen thus far, but concern because it looked like nobody had been here in about fifty years. There were rusty-looking trucks covered in so much grime, you couldn't see into the windscreens, or the windows, and sheets of metal strewn around the grounds. If I was a film director, I'd chose this location for a zombie apocalypse film. This is your fault, Tark. I whipped off his beaten-up old bag and dropped it by his feet. Couldn't you have your pilot drop us somewhere a little less creepy, and I don't know, maybe closer to the town? If it wasn't for me, you'd have had to fly to Florida, catch a connecting internal flight, and then somehow find a bus route here. All of that. It would take days of traveling. Why do I never get any gratitude? Because you're a douche. Donna offered him, shrugging her shoulders. Says the woman I saved from countless blisters. And by the way, you are not very light. Well, you're not very tall, and... I'm going to see if anyone works here. I passed them both a weary look and swallowed, as I tried to get a better look inside the shop. Everything looked so dirty and aged that I wished Tarquin was a big, strong man. We could hide behind while he investigated the situation. But big, strong, courageous men only existed in films. In real life, men took bribes to end relationships and then stole your baby names, or they robbed you after making you believe there was something between the two of you. Hastily wiping away a tear, I didn't realize I'd shed. I called out into the mass of cars. This place is abandoned. Donna's voice rang out. We should go, before it gets dark. I hadn't thought about that. I'm not the best when it comes to wildlife knowledge, but what if there were packs of wolves, lured in by the scent of Tarquin's, really pungent backpack? Oh, coyotes. 
I didn't know anything about coyotes, but the name conjured up pictures of carcasses by the side of the road. Shudder. And what about snakes? Didn't I read in a magazine at the doctor's that black mambas chase you? They actually rear up and hunt you down, and let's face it, the last time I ran was at school, and even then I came last in the cross-country race after walking most of the way. That snake would have me for dinner, and then maybe the coyotes would pick my bones clean. And then the creepy silence was broken. Hello, miss. What can I do you for? A bearded man about seventy years old suddenly appeared in front of me, with an axe in his hands. Run! I screamed out, hoping Donna and Tarquin could hear me, but I'd ventured further into the yard, mind wandering with thoughts of being savaged by an animal. I didn't bank on that animal being a bearded elderly killer with an axe. The bearded man mumbled something as I turned on my heels, darting between trucks, heart thudding, so hard I was either going to be sick or faint any moment now. I wasn't going to be chopped up into pieces for Lissa's photos. This was a step too far. Donna, Tark, run. Hold up there, miss. I didn't mean to startle you. The elderly bloke could move. I could hear him right behind me. I seriously needed to work out more. That's when I fell on my face, and I hoped that when I got to the Golden Gates, God had a burger for me. Because today, I'd earned it. Miss. A room packed with tools and aerosol paint cans came into view. Then I saw Tarquin and Donna, sitting on stools, holding glasses of water, both of them frowning with concern. The elderly axe man stood beside me, holding out a tumbler of water. I was slumped in a dog-eared armchair, and my nose felt like I'd run into a door. Hard. Let's say I've been there a few times before. I'm sorry if I startled you, miss. Emily, my wife, she asked me to cut down the trees out back. We're trying to sell this place. Been a long time since anyone passed through here. The old man no longer possessed the axe. Perhaps my imagination had run away with itself. We're looking for Haven. My voice sounded slurred, and I rubbed my forehead, expecting a cartoon-sized egg-shaped bruise. The man chuckled, leaning in towards me. For a second I thought he was about to kiss me, but his hand touched the table, and he smeared aside dust to reveal the words. Haven Motor Repairs. You found the right place. What I want to know is why three British kids chose to visit our town. He sounded suspicious. And we looked suspicious. Donna in her A. Lister's Gucci dress. Tarquin, with his posh boy threads, and me looking like the model for an over-sixties catalog. I'd imagine a man like him out in the middle of nowhere had a rifle. I had to keep him on side. We're backpackers. Donna blurted out, Backpackers. He didn't look convinced. I had to step in. Yeah. We're. We heard about this place from a guy we met on our travels. He said something about a beautiful lake, and we, we just had to see it. I was rambling, he'd see right through me. Lake Haven. The man looked wistfully into the distance. The most beautiful place on earth. You folks are lucky to have stumbled upon our town. I guarantee you won't want to leave, he smiled at me, and he looked less serial killer and more grandpa-like. Tell me, miss, who was it you met? Christopher Brody. You know him? Tarquin's turn to run the investigation. I pictured red, and a shiver danced across my skin. Suddenly a memory of last night came to me. The feeling of his hard chest against my... No, I don't think I do. I shook away the sensation that buzzed through me, a wanton sizzle, that made me lust, after a man, that was the worst kind of man for me. A compulsive liar. He sometimes goes by the name of Rat. I had to try. The chances are that this bloke wouldn't know him, but now I wasn't fearing for my life. I needed to get my head back in the game and take back what was mine. 
Red Eye watched as the old man's face creased into a smile. Rhett Buell. He rifled through papers on the desk and then found what he was looking for. This, the boy. He passed me a photograph. It must have been taken at least ten years ago, but it was unmistakably Rhett. His hair hung in that curtain's hairstyle everyone had after Leonardo DiCaprio, started in Titanic. And I was as mesmerized, then, as I was the first time I saw him. He looked like he'd stepped out of Dawson's Creek, gorgeous and glowing with that caramel tan. Rhett Buell. My kryptonite. That's him I nodded, and when I passed the picture back to him my hand shook, so hard I nearly dropped it. He doesn't come home a lot these days, but his mama lives right by the lake. And then he smiled again, exposing all his gums. Tell you what, why don't I take you down to meet her? I'll bet Jeannie Buell will be excited to meet y'all. After the week from hell, my luck was finally in.